Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Before I start, I want to give my sincere thanks to Dr. Yaqub for arranging this very important um, uh, session. Um, uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time to try to explain to you the, the history of the Rohingyas and how they became the most persecuted minority in the world. जो रोहिंग्या के साथ हो रहा है आप सब तो टीवी पर देख रहे हैं ये दिस इज द ग्रेटेस्ट ह्यूमैनिटेरियन क्राइसिस ऑफ आवर टाइम बट हाउ डिड इट कम टू दिस द रोहिंग्या माइनॉरिटी हैज बीन डिस्क्राइब्ड बाय द यूनाइटेड नेशंस एज द मोस्ट पर्सिक्यूटेड माइनॉरिटी इन द वर्ल्ड वी हैव फेस्ड वेव आफ्टर वेव ऑफ वायलेंस ओवर द लास्ट हाफ सेंचुरी The most recent wave is probably the worst that we have seen. But how did we come to this stage? I will just give you a very, very quick synopsis of the history of the Rohingya. The persecution of the Rohingya can be dated back to the Second World War, when the Japanese invaded what was at that time British Burma. The Rohingya minority stayed loyal to their British colonial masters, whereas the majority of Buddhist population decided to side with the Japanese invaders because they thought that the Japanese would be victorious and this would lead lead to swifter independence. So when the war ended, there was bad blood between the two people. But despite that, there was relative calm. up until 1962 when there was a military coup by a general nay win and general nay win he tried to implement what he called the burmese road to socialism which was a communist manifesto and it was a complete economic disaster so he did what a lot of generals and dictators do in that situation is that he tried to find a scapegoat get got to blame all the ills of society on and the rohingya minority who had a different language a different religion different skin color different features were the perfect minority for this blame and he passed a number of laws subsequent to that including the 1982 citizenship law which stripped all the rohingya of their citizenship and made them the largest stateless people around the world He also tried to equate Burmese nationality, Burmese citizenship, with being a, a loyal citizen. So only Buddhists can be loyal citizens of this country, and everybody else is a non-citizen. Now, one of the main areas of contention against the Rohingya is that the Buddhist majority claim that this term Rohingya is a manufactured term. It is a fake term. that these illegal people from Bangladesh they came over in the 1940s and 50s and they conjured up this term rohingya to give themselves an identity and this term did not exist before that so some of them even put a date on it some of them say that this term was created in march of 1942 and it did not exist before that so one of the things i tried to do in my book is to try to ascertain the veracity of these accusations and for that i went to the indian national archives in new delhi to dig up documents from the time of british burma and i dug up documents dating back to 1824 1826 some of them 1799 in which the commission the british commissioned a civil servant called charles patton to undertake a survey of this region to and then within that survey he clearly states that one in three souls are musliman sardars of rohingya origin and this term is used extensively through other historical documents so this accusation does not stand up to historical scrutiny but in many respects it's also irrelevant it's a red herring argument whether these people were from 1942 or whether they're from 1972 they, you know they were all born in burma and they deserve citizenship Now, one of the questions I'm asked very often is that what has been the role of Aung San Suu Kyi in all of this? Now, we know the situation of the Rohingya. In the last two months, over 650,000 have been forcibly displaced 
displaced from Myanmar into Bangladesh, adding on to another few hundred thousand. And I was there just a few weeks ago, and I can tell you the situation is catastrophic. You can climb on top of a hill, and as far as you can see, it's just camps, over almost one million refugee camps. And uh, what has been the role of this Nobel laureate that everybody has, has championed? Well, one of the things we have to understand is that why is this happening now? Why did this happen in 2017? Why was this not happening before? And I believe there's three reasons for this. Three key reasons why this happened in 2017 and not in 2015 or, or previously before. Number one is that the military undertook a dry run, a test run of this ethnic cleansing in October 2016 in which they burned dozens of villages and forced out almost 140,000 Rohingya into Bangladesh. And the military learned a number of things from, from this. Number one, they learned that Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public. She becomes a shield for any international criticism. So when the United Nations produced a report to say that 52% of Rohingya women had been raped, Aung San Suu Kyi said on her Facebook page, this is fake rape. When the, when the international community said, when Fergal Keane of the BBC asked her that ethnic cleansing is happening in your country, she said, ethnic cleansing is too strong a term to use for this. And when the United Nations passed a resolution to have a full-scale inquiry in March in 2017, she said this will not be very helpful and she, as the foreign minister of the country, refused to give them visas. So this is the first thing the military learned, is that Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public, she, she's a shield for the military and she becomes a lightning rod for international criticism. The second thing they learned is that the military was very unpopular. The military was very unpopular in Burma. And after this ethnic cleansing, they became very popular. They were unpopular, which is what forced them to have elections. But after this ethnic cleansing, they became known as the defenders of Buddhist values. So they became very popular. So this is the second thing. And the third thing they learned is that despite all the evidence of ethnic cleansing, genocide and killing in burning villages. Gen the military chief, the architect of this, General Minong Ling, he was still given a VIP trip invitation to Europe. Germany and Austria literally gave him the red carpet treatment and he went around various armament factories to buy weapons. And I wrote a piece on this in Newsweek in 2016 stating that the military is now gearing up for a massive offensive to fully uh, ethnically cleanse the Rohingya. So the next question is, is that why has there been no intervention from the international community in such a massive crisis of uh, this proportion? Well, the Rohingya have been described as the most persecuted minority in the world. They've also been described as the most friendless minority in the world because there is nobody advocating for them from the international stage. Now, I, I give presentations on the Rohingya <clears throat> over the last few months. I've been giving quite a few presentations. And one of the things I always ask the audience is that you have come here today to hear his talk on the Rohingya, but I don't think a single one of you can name me one Rohingya person. And this is the reality. There are no famous Rohingya people. The Rohingya are the lowest of the low. They are unable to advocate for themselves internationally, so let alone domestically. For example, there is a group of Rohingya families in Chicago, where I live, and the lady that is teaching them English said that it is so difficult to teach them English because they don't even know their own language. And most of them don't know how to hold a pen. They have been disenfranchised from the beginning to make sure that they are completely illiterate. Hardly any of them have a college education, and so none of them have actually made it on the international stage. There's nobody of Rohingya origin working in the BBC or elected to the British Parliament or the European Parliament or in Silicon Valley that can put, say, I'm going to put a few million dollars of my money into a public awareness campaign for my people. The Rohingya have not 
made it on the international stage. So there's absolutely no, no awareness of their plight. The second reason is geopolitics. The President of the United States visited Burma on a number of occasions, on two occasions, President Obama. The latest one was 2015. And for any country to get a visit from the President of the United States is a big deal. And the reason why President Obama visited is because as Burma opened up, it, the United States wanted to ensure it does not fall under the sphere of influence of China, which is the biggest investor in the region. Just like Pakistan, China is the biggest investor in Myanmar and Burma. And one thing it gives, uh, gives uh, China is it gives access to the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean, which changes the strategic calculus of that region, and they're able to surround India, their regional rival. So there's much larger geopolitical machinations going on behind the scenes between the US and China, trying to control the sphere of influence. So and when they have these kind of calculations going on, and you insert this minority called the Rohingya that nobody has heard of, it doesn't fit into that calculation. And the last thing I would say is that in terms of what the current situation is and what the future holds, I don't, at the moment there's almost a one million Rohingya in the refugee camps in Bangladesh. And there is a, an agreement between Myanmar and Bangladesh to repatriate them back to Myanmar, to back to Burma. I don't believe that this agreement will come to pass. I believe that the Myanmar government is simply trying to buy time, trying to buy as much time as possible until the, until the world's attention moves on and the Rohingya will become a permanent fixture in Bangladesh. They have no intention of taking back any Rohingya. They have spent half a century trying to get rid of them. They burnt down their houses, their villages, they have seized the land. The land has already been repatriated and redistributed amongst the locals who are now harvesting them. So they have nowhere to actually go back to. So the Rohingya will become a permanent fixture in Bangladesh. And the Bangladeshi government will only have two options. To either keep them indefinitely in those camps, which will then become a breeding ground for radicalisation and extremism. Because once you know you're going to live and die on handouts in a camp, and after you are dead, your children will live and die in this camp, then you have absolutely nothing to lose from that point onwards. Or Bangladesh will have to absorb them into their own population, which poses a significant challenge. One of the most densely populated countries in the world, in which the land mass is being reduced every year because of rising sea levels, one of the poorest countries in the world with extreme poverty, it will pose a significant challenge to Bangladesh. So this is where we are now with the situation of the Rohingya. Um, it is a very highly unfortunate situation uh, they find themselves in and uh, we can only hope that uh, they will find some international friends and partners that are able to advocate for them and able to lobby for them on the international stage. Thank you very much. Thank you for enlightening us with the problems and hidden facts about Rohingya's drastic conditions. Now I would request the fellow speaker to proceed the discussion further. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for the people who've come and thank you, Azim, for that excellent overview of the situation. In 1978, this is 40 years ago, uh, a news I see a quorum here, so it's, uh, I suppose it's uh, appropriate. Uh, an article was published on the front page of Dawn, which recounted an a eyewitness statement of a, a journalist from the Nouvelle, Le Nouvelle Observateur, a French journalist who was at the border between Bangladesh and Myanmar and saw an entire group of Rohingya being machine gunned. They were fleeing a situation where their homes had been burnt, where there was extreme sexual violence, where people had been tortured and they had been disappeared. And they had been ultimately forced across the border into Bangladesh, where 200,000 of them there were. This happened in 1978, and then it happened in the early 90s, and then it happened in 2009, and it happened in 2012. 
and they happened in 2015, and they happened, as Azim mentioned, in 2016, and now, in 2017. The tragedy of the Rohingya is that this isn't a suddenly, I mean, we have a perception that suddenly a crisis has arisen out of nowhere. It, that may be the case in terms of its coverage, but the tragedy is that it's been going on for so long and has been getting progressively worse. As Azim said, this is a tragedy that could have been, that was anticipated. The international community could have acted, they could have prevented it, and they failed to do so. The latest crisis, and I don't like to use, I mean, many people speak of this as a Rohingya crisis. No, it isn't. The Rohingya aren't the crisis. The crisis is that you have a Burmese military that is intense, on cry carrying out crimes against humanity, against these people, without any consequences for it, and do it repeatedly so. The current context is this, is that in October 2016, a group known as ASA, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, a little known group, an unknown group, one that emerged after the violence in 2012, carried out attacks on three border posts, and that triggered a wave of reprisals that led to a pattern of attacks with great speed, where people were, villages were targeted, not just by the military, but with the BGP and with local volunteers. People were encircled, they were forced out of their homes, their homes were torched. There was a, the following crimes against humanity took place. And this is, so in international law, crimes against humanity are what states are accountable for under customary international law, according to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Now, what it defines crimes against humanity as are the following human rights violations when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population with knowledge of the attack. Article 7.1 lists 11 crimes or acts, including murder, forcible transfer of population, torture, rape, as well as the persecution of any identifiable group on the grounds that are universally recognized and impermissible under international law. In October, what happened was that you had all of these crimes against humanity take place, including, um, and they're not, they weren't just widespread or systematic, they were both. The fact that there wasn't any action taken then actually led you to a situation in August 25th where Arsa commits another attack and with incredible speed you have the most ruthlessly efficient campaign of ethnic cleansing take place. Whereas, whereas 87,000 had been forced out of their homes in 2016, now the numbers increased to 650,000. These attacks Incidentally, and, and many people have credibly uh, looked into this, they could not have taken place, well, one, they were not proportionate, but they could not have taken place unless the preparations were there for those attacks to happen, for people to have villages mapped out, for them, for the villages to be systematically burned. And we had, one of the ways Amnesty International collected this evidence was actually to refer to satellite images. So you could actually see the pictures of these villages week after week. And what you see is a long stretch in three townships in Myanmar where villages have been systematically burnt. And they were burnt after the military went in with the help of volunteers and some testimonies of the most horrific things and I can't even sort of repeat some of them in this case, where people were approached, they, the villages were encircled by a mixture of the military volunteers and the local authorities. Men were taken to a side and killed. Women were, and you must have heard of the horrific uh, case that was widely reported, where some women had their babies snatched and thrown into the fire and were subsequently raped. The rape of women took place in a systematic manner across a very, very large population of the women there. The fear of being raped was so pronounced that actually the Rohingya began to marry off their daughters at an early age, so that these weren't the cruel circumstances in which, so if they were pregnant, they felt that they, they, they thought that's a protection and they wouldn't be raped in those cases. 
Bangladesh has actually stood out remarkably in this situation where what we are seeing throughout the world is what Pope Francis called the globalization of indifference when it comes to refugees. You have more than 45 million people who are refugees at this moment. It is the biggest crisis in Europe. In 2014 alone, 14 million refugees were created. And what we've seen, particularly from 2014 to 2015, is Europe and many countries who were actually the Refugee Convention was founded to deal with, to uh, cover refugees in Europe, have turned their backs. You have in the most extreme cases where people like the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban refer to Muslim refugees from conflict zones as illegal invaders. Chillingly, that is the same sort of dehumanizing language that has been used by the army in Myanmar. Now, but what this has created, and this led to a change of position in Bangladesh. Sheikh Hasina had traditionally not been, she'd been a very, reluct very reluctant when it came to, and ambivalent when it came to the Rohingya. In 2012, you can actually go back and see where she said, this is not our problem, we're not going to take, we're not going to take responsibility for them. And there were pushbacks, including uh, people being pushed back into the sea. And that's what led to the Andaman Sea crisis in 2015, where people were being smuggled and tried to make their way to Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia. And many of them died on the journey, or subsequently were put into detention camps, and there were discoveries of mass graves there. In this case, Bangladesh decided to take in 800, more than 850,000, which brings the total population of Rohingya refugees in the Cox's Bazaar district to more than a million. The Cox's Bazaar district is interesting because it actually has a history of this. It, was in, in, it gets its name in 1784 from the arrival of Captain Hiram Cox, who was dealing with a Burmese invasion of the, of the vestiges of the Arakanese kingdom, and you had a number of Rakhine who were pushed across them. The situation in the camps is utterly horrific. There is no country that could possibly deal with this situation in any, uh, without challenges, but this scale is extraordinary. You have 3,000 acres of previously forested land has been cleared to make what is an endless sprawl of flimsy settlements made of tarpaulin and bamboo. This is a part of Bangladesh that is vulnerable to cyclone season. This is a part that you have uh, a great spread of, in circumstances in which you have a great spread of disease. Um, this is a situation where the monsoon season means that People are very vulnerable to mudslides and their, and, their tent, and their settlements being wiped out in those situations. The situation is frankly unsustainable, but the problem, the tragedy for the Rohingya is that they have nowhere else to go. In Bangladesh, they are being registered, despite the popular sympathy that was there, as undocumented Myanmar nationals. They're not given refugee status in any kind of way, which affects the way they're being. They are being confined to the camps in Kutupalong village and other parts of Teknav in the Cox's Bazaar district and have restrictions on their freedom of movement. They are entirely dependent on humanitarian agencies and NGOs. Meanwhile, in Myanmar, they are seen as undocumented Bangladeshi nationals. On both sides, they are perpetually regarded as unwanted people. Uh, and this was actually captured in the haunting phrase by the Bangladeshi foreign minister who called them the Palestinians of the Bay of Bengal. The, what, the Myanmar military was actually quite prepared for this to be a permanent situation. So after the first wave of people who were pushed out, there were attempts to starve the rest of the Rohingya population in northern Rakhine states. And it led to a trickle, which actually went further south in northern Rakhine states. But the international reaction has been such 
that they have actually acknowledged in the end that they will have to take them back. And they were forced to the situation not by the UN Security Council, which has blocked, which blocked the resolution because of China, but, but China came and it said, okay, we are going to step forward and take control of this process. This is a big change for China in terms of how it dealt with the situation because traditionally under Deng Xiaoping, there was an idea of being restrained, holding back your strength, not being a player on the state. But with Xi Jinping, after the 19th Party Congress, China has decided that it will play a role on the world stage. So it got the, and it is China's massively influential, both in terms of Myanmar and in terms of Bangladesh. For China, the risks are great. It had a plan to actually have both Myanmar and Bangladesh be part of its Belt and Road Initiative. What it can't deal with is a situation where that, those infrastructure plans are jeopardized by crimes against humanity and a campaign of ethnic cleansing taking place, putting these two countries at, odd, at odds with each other. So an agreement took place, but as Azim said, it's a flawed agreement and it is unimplementable. Why? The tragedy of the Rohingya is not just the crimes against humanity that took place in these different, but also the circumstances in which they were being kept in Myanmar. Under the terms of agreement, which is based on a 1992 agreement, the Rohingya would have to go back to northern Rakhine State and be kept in an effectively internment camps. We, Amnesty International released a report earlier this year that looked at the situation and daily life for the Rohingya. And we came to the conclusion for the very first time that the situation amounts to the crime against humanity of apartheid. What do we mean by that? This is where the Myanmar authorities have severely restricted virtually all aspects of Rohingya life. There is extremely limited access to healthcare, to education, the ability to even leave their villages. There is a system in place that is designed to make their lives hopeless, humiliating as possible. Now, these violations aren't as visible as the horrific acts of violence that I described to you earlier. But in terms of what they amount to for their lives, they are no less serious. The repression intensified after 2012, when there was that wave of violence in Northern Rakhine State. And so the Rohingya have ended up essentially being cut off from the rest of the world. The regime of restrictions exists in a form of intricate web of national laws or, ro or local orders, which are then enforced with explicitly racist behavior. So for example, a, re a regulation says that foreigners and members of the Bengali races, as they call them, need special permits to travel between townships. In many cases, there are restrictions, even in terms of movement, between villages. In some cases, people cannot make use of roads and they are forced to travel by waterways. And even when they are allowed to travel, it is only from one Muslim village to another. In cases that they do manage to get these permits, the Rohingya are regularly harassed, intimidated, extorted for bribes, physically assaulted, and even arrested. Under the current circumstances, so we're faced with three different crises. One is there needs to be accountability for the crimes against humanity that took place. The deal that has been chalked out would actually reward the Myanmar military for its crimes against humanity and its campaign of ethnic cleansing. They may be forced to a point where they say, okay, we will take them back. But what stops people from being sent across the border again with the next wave of violence? One of the people I interviewed in Cox's Bazaar said, I've made this journey several times before. I'm not willing to go back. Any returns that take place have to be safe, dignified, and voluntary. If people do not fear, that, if they feel there is a genuine fear of persecution in Northern, if they were to return to Northern Rakhine State, then they, there's no reason that they should be forced into those circumstances. So they have to be held accountable. The other crisis is, so what happens with this large population of, by some estimates, more than a million people in Bangladesh, and how will they be sustained there in the long term? 
in for Bangladesh, this has become a real crisis. It is, as Lazim mentioned, a poor and densely populated country. There are elections underway. Chittagong division itself is actually the poorest part of Bangladesh. The situation has actually altered circumstances for people in Chittagong division. It has skewed the local economy. It's very hard, given the topography that you're dealing with, to actually have an uninterrupted supply of aid and resources there. There are no schools in place. There are no long-term, there are very limited facilities for the rehabilitation of these people, but there are no long-term plans there to be able to hold it. So that is a crisis that's confronting everyone. People can't see this as, you know, the biggest mistake would be if Bangladesh is abandoned to this crisis by itself. It's very interesting to see the reaction of the great powers of the region where India actually decided to side squarely with Myanmar in this crisis, and China has only intervened to be able to protect the Burmese military and its own interests in the Belt and Road Initiative. This is where actually I think Pakistan actually had played a good role, and it could do more of it, where Pakistan and the OIC, there are only two issues on which the OIC has been united recently. One has been the question of the Rohingya, and one was the question on Jerusalem. And this is where you had resolutions being passed at the UN by the General Assembly and being voted by a very, very large majority. However, UN General Assembly resolutions aren't binding. What's needed is for the UN Security Council to make a referral to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court. The crimes, and we have some brilliant legal minds here, they'll, they'll be able to tell you more about this, but the crimes against humanity committed according to international criminal law are subject to universal jurisdiction, which means that these arrests, rather than them being fated in Europe, these arrests can take place in any jurisdiction. So we need to have accountability for these generals, and that's the only way that this will not happen. And then you have to have a dismantling of the apartheid system that exists. So that discrimination is wiped out and uprooted, which is a long-term task, but it's the only way to actually allow the Rohingya to have a safe and dignified existence and to stop these waves of crimes against humanity taking place. I'll end on one thing, and this is actually what, this is the urgency that's, that confronts everyone, is, and it's appropriate, I guess, we're in Lahore, where Patras Bukhari, Ahmed Shah Bukhari, was the UN permanent representative for Pakistan. And he was known as humorist, but in his role at the UN, he would actually make some very, very serious statements. He was known as a spokesperson for the Arab and Asian bloc. And he made an appeal to the international community in 1952 in terms of the crisis in Tunisia, but the words are worth repeating in this case. He said there is a fire that is taking place. In this case, literally, there is a fire. And we are not the arsonists. We need, we are just saying there is a fire that needs to be dealt with. We are calling on the fire department to take action. Will they take action? And if they don't, it will be a disgrace. Thank you. Truly such heart-wrecking realities. Thank you, Mr. Umar and Mr. Azim, for sharing your research on Rohingya and the problems and challenges being faced by the people of Rohingya, how Myanmar is making their life miserable and what is needed to be done internationally. Now I would like the panel to be open for question answering session with the audience. If anyone have any questions, please. Uh, for the very informative session, uh, my question uh, to Azim uh, would be, what was Pakistan's response uh, when Bangladesh was East Pakistan uh, from 1947 to 71 uh, to Rohingya crime, you know, uh, Rohingya minority? One of the, I, I, I'm fully aware that, uh, you know, Pakistan may have a lot of problems. You have you had many refugee crises here. You have taken in, you know, hundreds of thousands of Afghan refugees in the past. And, uh, you know, ye jo Rohingya uh, ke ho raha hai, it's very easy to point fingers at other countries, ban like Bangladesh or Myanmar, or and say, look, ye kaise slow kar rahe hai, ke ke saath, ye, you know, um, uh, is, is very um, uh, bad. 
but Pakistan itself, you know, and many people are not aware of this, is host to hundreds of thousands of Rohingya themselves, you know, in Karachi. The New York Times puts this number at 500,000, 500,000 Rohingya uh, ghettoized in Karachi. Now, I don't know if that number is accurate. 55,000. 55,000, 55, right. So 55,000 to 70,000 is the numbers that I've heard. Now, I, I, I don't know how accurate that is. I've had no way to ascertain its veracity. But as far as I'm aware, what I have been told for many Rohingya diaspora is that they are being treated in these ghettos in Karachi in the same way that they are actually being treated as if they are in refugee camps. They are denied access to citizenship, they are denied access to employment and they have apparently the police has a special division you know, called the uh, Burmi, Burmi division to just tackle the problem of the Rohingya problems. Um, so I, I think as Pakistani citizens, the priority has to be to try to fix what is at home first before we try to look at uh, wider afield. And we as Muslims are very, very adept, adept at pointing fingers at other people committing atrocities against Muslims. But we're very inadequate when those atrocities are being committed by Muslims themselves. You know, in fact, Muslims commit the most atrocities against each other by a very wide margin, very wide margin than anybody else can. But atrocities to register for us have to be committed by India, Israel or America for it to actually register. Um, uh, so we, and it's also my understanding, and once again, I, I couldn't get this confirmed, but um, um, the Pakistani military is providing fighter jets to Myanmar. So I wrote an article about this. I contacted the Pakistani government to try to verify if this is true. Some of them denied it. Others confirmed it. Others said it's true. And Myanmar, Burma is a country that has no external enemies. So all the military equipment is used against its own population. You know, so this is something that you also have to look at and uh, try to hold your own government to account that they can point fingers at others. But you have internal issues which should be addressed first when it comes to the Rohingya refugees. Historical side, sir. Uh, from 1947 to 71, uh, I was referring to that. Uh, what was Pakistan's stance at that time? You know, we, we have uh, read somewhere that Rohingya uh, wanted to become part of East Pakistan when, you know, uh, partition of India occurred. Yeah, so there was a, a group of Rohingyas at that time who be, uh, they felt that uh, to join with uh, Bangladesh, the Rakhine district should be included within uh, the Bangladesh when Bangladesh was being formed and they should be given Bangladeshi citizenship. But that obviously fell by the wayside, but that's also now being used by many of the, 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 the Rakhine Buddhists and other elements within the country to demonstrate that these people have never been loyal to, to Myanmar. They have always been loyal to Bangladesh and outside forces. And even though from the, from the Rohingya perspective, it was simply an act of self-preservation because of the discrimination that they were facing. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, Excellent presentation of facts and analysis, really. Thank you very much for doing this. Both of you, Azim and Umar. I was looking for some kind of a solution. What are you proposing? What at least the community? We heard the problems, we had the difficulties. But what is the international community doing about it? Is there any plan or any proposal to resolve this issue? If Bangladesh is not becoming a solution, what can we do? Can there not be some other large land areas like Australia, where they can be settled, so they are able-bodied, healthy people, they can be rehabilitated. As some land in uh, Ethiopian were migrated to Israel, they took them there as a labor force. They need labor force. There are many countries who need labor force. Why can't we plan a strategy where they could be sent as, as an immigrant labor force? Yeah, I think Australia, I would much rather that they didn't try to go there because, because of the way Australia treats refugees. Since 2013, Australia has established two offshore detention centres on Manus Island and on Nauru. And just to stop people taking boats and coming, 
to trying to seek asylum in Australia. They have subjected them to cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, including some people who are Rohingya. This is a country whose signature brought the Refugee Convention into force. And I'm frankly sad to say, Australia, when it comes to refugee rights, is a rogue state. The sad thing is the global indifference when it comes to refugees, and it deals with the numbers. Even in terms of the humanitarian response that people can mount, the crisis is that when there is a crisis so in, in Bangladesh with the refugees, what that means is funds get diverted from Sudan or from Yemen to be able to address that crisis at a particular time. At the moment, there are only, there is, Europe has turned its back on refugees in a very big way. And one of the ways they did this was they actually signed a deal with, the EU signed a deal with Turkey and said, if you can stop them from reaching Greece, these are the funds you can have. Turkey has taken in a huge number. Jordan has taken in so many that the king uh, says there that it's the country's at boiling point. In Pakistan, you've had millions of refugees, and now you have a huge situation in Bangladesh. The Rohingya have a right to return to their homes, and many of them actually would like to go. But given the circumstances there, the only way that can happen, I think, is if the Burmese military is held accountable for its crimes against humanity, if the system of discrimination, which amounts to the crime against humanity of apartheid, is dismantled and swept aside, and if they're given their full rights, including citizenship. That's the only way, that's the only sustainable solution. And any other attempt to actually distract from that amounts to consecrating an injustice. I'll just add to that, sir, that uh, uh, in terms of the international solution, you know, I had a friend of mine, she spoke, she's a, works for a very large NGO, she's a physician, and at the beginning of this crisis, she spoke, she was at the UN and she spoke to some UN officials, and uh, the, one of the very senior officials said to her, he said, look, there were 11 million Syrians displaced, 11 million, 500,000 dead, 11 million displaced, and the UN didn't do anything. Yeah? So you people have a long way to go before you even appear on our radar. So this was the reaction of the United Nations and the international community. You know, the solution, is, as, as Omar has said, is that almost every Rohingya that I spoke to in the camps when I was there, and I spoke to some of them that arrived literally hours I spoke to them the same morning. I asked them, will you be willing to go back? All of them, all of them, including ones with families and everything else, they said yes, but only if we're given full citizenship and equal rights. Now, Bangladesh was criticized before because they had a policy of not permitting Rohingya into their country to close the border. And many people said this was you know, improper and that it was cruel. But this, is, this was actually the correct policy of Bangladesh. This is not Bangladesh's problem. They cannot be repatriated to a third country. These people are Burmese citizens. They deserve to have citizenship of, by, of their country if that's what they want. They cannot be taken to a third country. Uh, one final thing I would say is that... I, I would just say that everyone does have a right to seek asylum from persecution. Yeah, so that's another thing is that Bangladesh is not recognizing them as refugees. The entire project in the refugee camps is being led by the IOM not by the UNHCR for that particular problem, even though that's changed now, because they don't want to recognise them as refugees and give them refugee status. The Bangladeshi government is very strict to keep them in the camps. They're not allowed to leave the camps. They cannot get into a motor vehicle, whether it's a taxi or an ambulance, and no cell phone provider can provide them with SIM cards in Bangladesh. But the other point I would make is that I was asked this exact question by, by somebody in the United States, a, a US senator, who said, look, these Arab countries, you know, they take in so many, bring in so many workers, almost 50%, 60%, sometimes 80% of the population are foreign workers from Bangladesh, India, uh, you know, Pakistan. You know, why don't they just take these Rohingyas instead? And I responded to say, well, look, when these workers come to any of these countries in the Gulf, they first take their passports from them, and when they're tired of those workers, they send them back. Where will they send the Rohingya back to once they're tired of them? 
something that they don't want now. The only solution would be to get them citizenship, and they didn't even give Syrian citizens citizenship. Remember, there are Arab countries that not take one Syrian refugees, one Syrian refugees. They will tell you the Gulf countries that they took 220,000, they took not one refugee because they know when those people come to their own country, you give them citizenship, they're more educated, they're more entrepreneurial, they know the language, they know, they know the religion. Within one generation, they will take over our country. They will take over. Our own youth are not capable. These Syrians are much more capable. This is just an example of, uh, of the attitude that many of these countries have. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very enlightening talk by both the speakers. Uh, I have two questions. Is human trafficking an issue in this regard? Because whenever there's a humanitarian crisis or a refugee crisis, you see human trafficking uh, on the rise. And my second question would be that uh, recently, I believe last week, the Commander-in-Chief of the Myanmar's uh, military, he for the first time made an acknowledgement that 10 Rohingya were killed somewhere in September. So do you think this acknowledgement would help the cause of the Rohingya? Because so far, the military was in denial. And would this also help in you know, showing the world the real face of Aung San Suu Kyi because she's revered and celebrated all over the world as a Nobel you know, Peace Laureate. So uh, I would like to ask this question to both the speakers, please. Human trafficking has been a major, major concern. In fact, the human trafficking started on their journeys over. The way many of people crossed the Naf River was that boats came and they charged people whatever their savings were took jewelry from women, only to be able to make that journey across. Afterwards, the, the Bangladesh uh, border guards did tort some of those boats, but human traffickers are, in some ways, and actually, sorry, I, I'm shocking, but there was a UN senior humanitarian coordinator who said to me, if I was a Rohingya, maybe that's my best bet. To jump on a boat and try and make my way to Indonesia or Malaysia or somewhere. Um, that, as we've seen in the Andaman Sea crisis in 2015, was a huge, huge, um, huge disaster, um, a, a great tragedy. So that, along with people who are exploited, this is sexual exploitation in terms of recruitment for armed groups, all of these things are hazards that, and actually the existence of this mega camp that they have in Bangladesh. I think Bangladesh has actually done remarkable in terms of being able, taking all these people in, welcoming them, but the conditions they're being kept in are extremely, extremely difficult. And the mega camp that they've created, which could become the world's largest refugee camp, only exacerbates them. On the question of Minon Lang, I, I thought that was a very, very important concession that they made, that there was a mass grave and these 10 bodies were fine. After all, I mean, when it comes to these things, when it comes to the legal obligations, it's not the number, it's the act. That's what matters. Even if it happens to one person illegally, that is sufficient to account and call for accountability. But this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what it is. I think it's a very important concession, but if they really are genuine about this and they say they have nothing to hide, they should stop detaining the journalists who report on this, like the two Reuters journalists. They should allow the UN fact-finding mission to actually be carried out, and they should allow other international observers and humanitarian observers. Right now, Northern Rakhine State is just completely sealed off. On your last point, now when it comes to Aung San Suu Kyi, Aung San Suu Kyi is, uh, I think everyone has actually come around to, this is my view, that she was a very brave person in terms of her personal struggle in Myanmar. In terms of the way she endured house arrest, in terms of the way she fought for democracy. But if you look over the past 40 decades, the 40 years that she had been active, she never said anything about minorities, ever. The Rohingya only one minority in Myanmar who are being discriminated against and subject to violence. You have the Kachin, you have the situation in Shan State, you have in Rakhine State as well, you have Rakhine Buddhists who have been discriminated against. You have other Muslims in Rakhine State and you know over in Sitwe who have been discriminated against. Uh, pretty much anyone, if you're not a Bama Buddhist is subject to uh, humiliating circumstances. The Rohingya stand out not just because of the violence that they've endured, but also because of the fact that they don't have any citizenship. 
and they don't have any rights if they're not even seen as part of the 132 groups, whereas they were before 1982. Now, the situation that Aung San Suu Kyi is in is actually, it's quite similar to Benazir Bhutto in 1988. The foreign ministry, the defense ministry, the home ministry, the border affairs are controlled by the military. They're not under the control. This reminds me of, you know, um, the situation that Benazir had, where she had Ghulam Asad Khan on top of her, Sabzada Yaqub Khan sitting, you know, as uh, the ghost of Zia in the cabinet um, and confining them. Then, if you look at the parliament, a quarter of all seats in parliament are controlled by the military. And then you have the UMP, which is a military back, it's the, the equivalent of the Gulf League. Okay, you have these politicians who are basically collaborators with the military and they sit there and they make so actually a, a, a constitutional amendment is simply not possible in these circumstances. I think what Suu Kyi has done is unconscionable in terms of the way she has acted, but she's not the one in control. She's not the one in power. She has supported it, she has backed it, she has defended it, she has stood with it, and it's actually stood with a base. The scary thing is just the incredible levels of Islamophobia in Myanmar, and the incredible levels of denial. If you look at, I thought Pakistani social media was a scary place, but if you check out Myanmar social media, it's really something else. They are convinced that all of the Rohingya are armed terrorists. They, and they're convinced that they did nothing. And if you look at the popular narrative, it's that these were injured, these one million of them got together, killed our army, and then decided to flee en masse. And people believe this. So I think, you know, I mean, there has to be, there's a, it's an astonishing distance from reality that we're at. I think that will have to be narrowed. I'll just add to that, you know, I agree completely with Omar that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, she does not control the military, yeah, so she does not direct, and in fact many people I met said there's no contact between her and the military, so she doesn't have any mechanism by which to actually advocate even to the military, but she does have one weapon which is very, very powerful, and that is her voice, that is her voice. As the moral conscience of that country, as the most famous citizen of that country, as a Nobel laureate, she could use her voice. And she is, in fact, very popular in her country. Even if she were to make slight changes, you could take many people along with her. She got 80% of the vote. And one of the reasons, you know, we got Aung San Suu Kyi so wrong, and I wrote a piece in Newsweek on this just about a month ago, and I urge you to have a look at it. It was called, How We Were Seduced by Aung San Suu Kyi. And I interviewed half a dozen people who knew her very intimately over the last few decades, including individuals. One of the individuals who started the free Aung San Suu Kyi campaign, another individual who used to smuggle papers to her in prison at huge risk to himself. All of them went on record and told me unequivocally she's always been a Burma Buddhist nationalist. She always has believed that Burma belongs to the Buddhists and it's the Buddhist country that just happens to have those minorities within it. And one of the reasons we elevated her so high and overlooked a lot of her shortcomings is because this is a need that we have. We like to have our heroes in a pedestal untarnished. And her story is one of the best stories you'll ever hear. The daughter of one of the founding generals of Myanmar, placed under house arrest by her father's former colleagues. Oxford educated, beautiful, articulate, speaks the Queen's English, Nobel Prize. Now she's out of prison taking on those generals. This is the stuff we make Hollywood movies out of. We put these people on a pedestal. We think because they're educated in Oxford, they're going to go back to their own countries and reform their countries. And we make this mistake over and over again. If you remember Bashar al-Assad, the London-trained ophthalmologist that was being quoted by Tony Blair, turned out to be one of the greatest mass murderers of his time. If you remember Kim Jong-un, the Swiss educated at, the, at a boarding school, he's going, going to bring his country in from the cold. Now he's threatening us all with North Korea, Saif al Gaddafi, and all these Arab princes. You know, these people are ideologically committed. These people are the elite in their society, and when they go to Oxford and Georgetown, they become the elite of the elite in their society. And for many of them, in all honestly, they cannot give up the power. As soon as they give up any power, they, are, they will be wiped out, them and their families.
You know, so we get this wrong over and over again without realizing that look, these people are have a very different world view than the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last question of the session. We are short of time. So thanks for uh, elaborating on this subject. Uh, my question is, uh, as a common person, we are at the receiving end of all news, including this issue. We hear what we are told. We see what we are shown. How to access the truth, sir? That's a very good point. Um, I, and I think there's actually a crisis everywhere where, you know, I mean, the most astonishing thing for me, the example is the US, where you have a president who and an Urdu verse Ji. Kis pe yakin kijiye, kis pe yakin na kijiye. Lae hain unki bazm se, log khabar alag alag. I think aapne jwaab hai diya to. Okay, we have one more question. Hi, uh, you just briefly mentioned uh, the really uh, disturbing situation of the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and Cox's Bazaar and the camps there and the situation of the camps. And you mentioned that um, they're breeding grounds for extremism and radicalization. Um, so one, I'd just like to know, like, are there specific, uh, I mean, has there been done, has there been any analysis of actual linkages with extremist groups? Or is this just kind of more of a concern in terms of what could potentially happen? And also, in terms of bringing this issue more prominently, I think it is, I mean, I work in the development community, international development community, and I think it is definitely uh, on the radar. Uh, of course, funding is an issue, but I think this this concern about the, the links with extremism and radicalization, and as you know, the UK has a huge prevent agenda. All international donors are looking at this very seriously and trying to prevent extremism and seeing what they can do to, to prevent extremism before it happens. So looking at it, I mean, beyond, because you, you have kind of pots of money for, for humanitarian crisis and refugee crisis. There are different pots of money than for extremism and radicalization, which often is a priority. And I think by kind of pushing it from that perspective that what can potentially happen with this group of people who are disenfranchised that don't have economic opportunities, don't have basic services, it's, it's, it's basically a, a, you know, an explosion waiting to happen. And I think pushing that angle um, can, can bring in more international attention. Yeah, I think the tragedy is that we securitize human beings too much. So the, the, the narrative that the Myanmar military was able to sell very effectively domestically was these are terrorists. And once you say that, and when you say there is a terrorist group, you, you're talking about an uncontrollable threat of some kind that lets people get away with whatever they want. And then the tragedy on the other side is, oh, well, we will only worry about the Rohingya if they're going to become terrorists. But up to that point, we're not, we, we're not concerned. I, I think that, I mean, I, I, it's, you're absolutely right. That is a situation, but it is scary that people think in this kind of way. Um, as far as the Rohingya are concerned, I think there's a danger of exaggerating this terrorist threat. ASA is a very small, very badly organized, very, you know, uh, it is not a global terrorist organization. It is not Al-Qaeda 5.0 or ISIS 2.0, as some people like to say. So, and if you look at the Rohingya themselves, they are not extremists by disposition of any kind. These are very moderate people, you know, by any uh, term. So I would much rather that actually governments uh, operate out of humanitarian concerns rather than fears of terrorism spreading. Can I, can I just add very quickly to that here? When Aung San Suu Kyi first came to power, she set up a number of commissions to look at the problems in the country. One of the commissions she set up was to look at the civil wars in the country. Almost every ethnic group was at, had been at war you know, with the central government since independence. It was the longest running civil wars in the, in, in the country, in, in the world. They're called the Pong Long Two. She, she included every ethnic group in those discussions, except the Rohingya. Because the Rohingya did not have a militant right, 
they did not they were not regarded as a militant organization or an extremist organization this is something that was came that was almost manufactured much later on you know so they were never regarded and i'm actually shocked i've been going there for a number of years now that they haven't been radicalized earlier you know i would certainly i know in that situation when you all is lost you have nothing you don't even have an identity you know everybody in that situation would be would be radicalized ladies and gentlemen the session i i don't know about bangladesh or bring us about bangladesh but in karachi in the vicinity of ibrahim happy during year there are lots of growing up for me and linkages have been found between them and especially the leader over of the leader and dash isis and that's why that police forms was formed and if you talk to the rajya journalists they can give you evidence and they can give you a uh, fact and figures more but it is a fact that karachi is going to have linkages with isis you know I, i have heard of that and i've also heard about representatives of lashkar e taiba yeah. going to yeah. bangladesh and and trying to you know create some sort of presence there um, uh, but at, at the moment as it is you know it is not sufficient enough to actually pose a threat but the longer you leave this problem yeah sure yeah but as lo- the, the longer you leave this problem whether it's in karachi or in cox bazar the more inevitable it will become you know this is this is uh, just common sense thank you so much ladies and gentlemen please put your hands together for our honorable guest for such an informative session thank you